from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Scenes from the Pro Farmer Crop Tour. Why it's about so much more than corn and soybeans. Plus, who's finding the bigger yields? Scouts in the West. I'm Michelle Rook here in Western Iowa where crop scouts are trying to determine if crops in the southern third of the state can make up for deficits in the north. Or the East. The big question this year on Crop Tour is does Illinois really have a 225 bushel per acre statewide average yield like USDA is currently estimating? We'll find out today as we take you to the fields of Illinois on Crop Tour. What we're seeing so far as the 2024 Pro Farmer Crop Tour rolls toward its final destination, right now on Ag Day. Ag Day is brought to you by Pioneer. Ben's Ben's, please hold. Yeah, Ben's has been busy all day. It seems like no one can keep up with this new Z series. What did you all put in these seeds? Science. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. It's the final day of the 2024 Pro Farmer Crop Tour. And if what scouts have seen so far this year on the tour holds true, it could be a big year for corn and soybean yields. Now in the east, scouts are finishing up, checking eastern Iowa crops, traveling from Iowa City to the final destination, Rochester, Minnesota. USDA expecting record corn yields from both states. And from the west, scouts are leaving Spencer, Iowa, and will meet up with the eastern leg, also in Rochester. USDA also expecting higher soybean yields from Iowa and Minnesota. It follows day three of the tour where scouts traveled right through the heart of where USDA has made big yield predictions for the Midwest, Illinois. Now the eastern leg rolling from Bloomington, Illinois to Iowa City, Iowa, Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan joins me in Tyne. These are crops Eastern Scouts really were looking forward to checking out. Well, all eyes were on Illinois leading into a crop tour. That's because USDA printed that 225 bushel per acre statewide yield estimate in its August report. And Scouts knew if Illinois really does have that big of a corn crop this year, they would have to find a consistent crop everywhere. Instead, Scouts found disappointment and some really big yields. Eat your Wheaties if you're going to pull these beans out. Mark Bernard's been scouting fields across the eastern leg of Crop Tour for 21 years. And this year, there's up 48, 49, 50, 51. He's measuring a monster bean crop in Illinois. That's kind of been the one problem. Illinois has really got some nice beans. It takes a long time to count them. He says the plants are loaded. With mostly three bean pods, Bernard did see some insect pressure. But the damage wasn't enough to rob yields. And as he traveled across Illinois closer to Iowa, the pod counts grew even more. As we're coming west, I think we're going to start to see pod counts increase. And that's that's what I've seen so far. But the scouts were less than impressed with Illinois' corn. One sample is 140, our second stop this morning. We just sampled this field. And we're oh, roughly 30 or 40 miles from that other spot. And this is 100 bushel better corn. But a 100 bushel per acre swing in just 30 miles could spell trouble for setting a new yield record in the state. If we want to have a record, you have to have no variability, and there's that's a amount of variability. Even with the problems in places. You can already see this ear is already fully dented, and it's a nice fat ear around. There are still parts of Illinois with a phenomenal corn crop growing in the field. It's hard to tell if it's going to be a record crop, but certainly things are set up for a record crop. Dennis Wentworth farms just outside of Bloomington. He says they have near perfect plant populations and they've seen ideal weather. And that means on his farm in McLean County, he could be growing a record crop. I would say we will end up in that 240 to 260 bushel range. I think overall we're going to be 20 to 30 bushel, which would be 10 to 15 percent above last year. With the potential to see yields 30 bushel per acre better than last year on this farm, scouts on crop tour wanted to see consistent fields like this everywhere across the state. And this year, they didn't. But are you disappointed? Yeah, I'm disappointed. I, yeah. All right, thanks, Ty. Not to be outdone, but USDA was also calling for a big corn crop in Iowa at 209 bushels per acre, which would be another record high. Agnes Michelle Rook reports on what scouts were finding in the West as they traveled from Nebraska City, Nebraska to Spencer, Iowa. Crops in West Central and Southwestern Iowa are seeing improved moisture and yield potential over a year ago. 
The big key here in Iowa will be whether those better crops can make up for possible deficits in the north to still achieve record to near record yields. As scout in Iowa farmer Roger Savine hits fields in southwest Iowa, he has high expectations. Southwest Iowa this year in District 7 is going to be a lot better than what it was a year ago. And the first four corn yield checks don't disappoint. Fields are clean and yields range from 203 to 245 bushels per acre. The difference is better moisture and higher ear counts. We ended up in uh, the 60 feet a row where we checked. It was uh, 110 ears. Ear count makes a big, big difference. Management. He says kernel depth will also add test weight and yield. This is more of an 80,000 kernel bushel farm, or these, what I've seen in these first stops today. Uh, the kernels are the size of your index fingernail. Soybean fields are also nearly pest and weed free and showing high production potential. They got a lot of pods on. We pulled our number two sample was 2,800 some pods. This, this field right here was 1860, I think. The size of the beans is also impressive thanks to some timely August rains. The pods are nice and fat. And that should translate into high yields in his estimation. 70, 75. The way they look now and if they finish, they're going to be really good beans. However, the question is, can Iowa hit the record 209 corn yield and 61 bushel bean target set by USDA with problems north of Highway 20, including flooding. I think the central third of Iowa is really pretty strong. I think the southern third is pretty strong as well. Probably stronger than we've been in several years. Uh, the northern third is going to be the challenge. So the jury is still out until the combines roll. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. And let's review the results from day two. Scouts in Indiana finding an average corn yield of 187.54 bushels to the acre. They reported high ear counts, grain length, and a higher number of kernels around the cob compared to last year. But they're expecting even bigger things out of the state's soybean crop. Teams counting 1,409 pods in a 3 by 3 foot square, almost 14% above the three-year crop tour average. In fact, it's the tour's fourth highest pod count average ever and the highest since 2002. While in Nebraska and the Western Leg, Scouts reported 173.25 bushels to the acre on average for corn, up more than 3% from last year. They said there were corn fields with fewer ears, but that the grain length and number of kernels around the cob were higher compared to 2023. As for soybeans, Scouts cutting an average of 1,172 pods in a 3 by 3 foot square. That's up from a year ago, but only 2% higher than the three-year average, although infield moisture is 30% higher. The 2024 Pro Farmer Crop Tour and Ag Day is brought to you by Pioneer, combining cutting edge research with one of the largest local testing programs in the industry to help farmers succeed. Pioneer, what's next happens here. By Citavo Soybean Seed, distributed exclusively by BASF. And by New Leaf Symbiotics, science-led, performance-driven, and data-backed, offering biostimulants for corn, soy, cotton, and peanuts, and a revolutionary new bioinsecticide for corn rootworm. And later tonight, we put a wrap on the 2024 Pro Farmer Crop Tour. It's the final night of Crop Tour Live online. To watch, just follow the link over at agweb.com or on Ag Day social media channels just before 8 o'clock Central Time, 9 o'clock Eastern. Make sure you're online and ready to go because we will have the complete results from Iowa and Minnesota right at the top of the hour. While some areas of the Midwest could use a decent rain to help finish the crops out, scouts may not see much in the way of clouds today. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has a look ahead for us. Well, we start to wrap this up. Uh, coming up before our Thursday, uh, like we saw the last couple of days, most of the moisture and the rain chances are going to hold off and, and be back here to the east. So depending on the route, obviously it's not going to be a straight shot from Iowa City to Rochester, uh, but in along this way for our Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, not seeing much in the way of significant rainfall on a Thursday between these two locations. Now as we go a little bit to the west, as I mentioned you know, yesterday and the day before with the ridge of high pressure, we got these showers not necessarily moving from the west to the east, but more north to south. Now, so as you look at these two locations, this is Thursday at 7 a.m. You know, we start to see the rain increase, rain chances increase to the west, but a lot of them are going to struggle to make it to the east. 
Friday is a bit of a different story as the, the showers that ridge of high pressure controlling the direction is going to be moving to the east a little bit more. Soybean markets finding a reason to move a little bit higher while it was a mixed day for livestock markets. We'll talk about it all coming up next. And later, it's not all work in crunching numbers. We'll catch up with tour scouts as they take a moment to enjoy the road in the country. We're awaiting word on new information regarding a potential rail strike in Canada. The strike, which was scheduled to begin early this morning, involves Canada's two major railway companies, Canadian National Railway and Canadian Pacific Kansas City. At last report, last minute talks were continuing with the Teamsters Union to avoid a work stoppage. The railways move an average of 69,000 metric tons of fertilizer products per day, equivalent to about four to five trains daily. And it's reported the country's trucking industry would not be able to meet the needs to keep critical supplies and daily goods flowing if union rail workers do go on strike. Now, USDA has warned the impact would be, quote, devastating, hitting the flow of farm goods in the U.S. and beyond. Soybeans turning to the upside after another sale was reported to China, while cattle futures extended Tuesday's heavy losses. Ag Day's Michelle Rook has some cattle and hog hedging strategies in Markets Now. Joining us with Markets, Kent Beta with Paradigm Futures. And Kent, we're in an environment now where we have low grain prices. So let's talk about what that means for both cattle and hog producers in terms of hedging opportunities. First for cattle, with the futures discount, do you think the lower corn prices will help and what are the crush margins looking like? You know, the cattle crush margins are actually quite good. And, uh, um, you know, obviously uh, corn futures are very, very cheap. They are well underneath the cost of production. And I believe that very, very soon uh, the industries that use corn as, a, as, a, as an input are going to start looking at the situation and asking themselves how long is corn going to be on sale at below cost of production? And they're going to start to buy. Um, you know, and I think that as a cattle producer, uh, that's something that you need to take a look at. You need to start thinking about getting your corn costs locked in uh, for the long term. Feeder cattle prices have uh, have come down fairly significantly, and uh, and and so I like uh, locking in feeders here and corn prices here, and then uh, you know taking a look at that margin. Um, you know I do still think there is upside again in in cattle, and so what we what we like there is some sort of a fence where we would uh, protect the downside with a put and probably sell a call above the market. Hog scenario is somewhat similar. Futures at a discount to the index, but you have these low feed prices. So what should we do there? The hog crush is okay, but not great. Um, there's not, uh, there's really not margin being shown uh, for October through February. Uh, April is okay. June has profitability, but it's not historically good profitability. Um, yeah, I do still think that uh, the, the feed component of a hog crush margin should be locked in. Um, certainly, if you don't want to buy the futures, you would, uh, calls are very inexpensive right now. And um, and then you're going to want to, you know, take a look at rallies uh, and uh, probably think about similar strategy, long put, short calls, giving yourself some upside. All right. Thanks for that insight. to Kit Beetle Paradigm Futures. We'll have more ag take now. Let's look at the temperature outlook August 28th through September 3rd. High confidence uh, in some above average temperatures uh, back into the Gulf Coast states, uh, Louisiana, Alabama, also into uh, Georgia and Florida. A different story back up here to the north and to the northeast. Again, the 28th through the 3rd, a pocket of cool air. And as we know, regarding the jet stream and just the weather in general, uh, this, as we get deeper into September, is going to try and shift to the east. But notice it's normal temperature. It's not a pocket of really cold air or even below average air. It's just kind of showing that heat starting to break down across the United States. It's something that we're going to be dealing with uh, during that time period and a little bit before then as well. Precipitation outlook, August 26th through the 30th, you got uh, dry air back in across the Midwest. This is the ridge of high pressure continuing uh, to uh, influence 
of the pattern with again low chance of rain and above average high temperatures so start to sneak in some wetter than average uh, conditions back up into the Dakotas as we try and get another clipper weak clipper system working across the United States again that's August 26th through the 30th back to a dry pattern in the northwest and back into Oregon and also into Washington so what does this look like from a jet stream perspective so here's a look at it on Thursday. You have that cutoff flow continue to move to the north and the east and bring it with it. A substantial rainfall, severe weather, as well as cloud cover and cool temperatures. Once we lose that cutoff low, most of the United States is going to be dominated by the ridge that you see on your screen here. And it's all about strength and placement with that ridge. Right now, it's looking like it's going to take over nearly two thirds of the United States. Again, there's the jet stream on Friday. By Saturday and Sunday, you see how amplified this ridge becomes keeping any jet stream energy that could bring the showers or cooler temperatures back up here to the north and to the northeast. Start off with Oklahoma begs a partly cloudy 88 degrees low of 67 Benton South Dakota high around 81 low of 66 and Mora New Mexico Mora Mora what mostly sunny high of 84. EPA releasing its latest plans to protect endangered species from herbicides. We'll have details next. And later, strike a pose as our teams on crop tour have a little fun in the field today in the country. A developing story we're following a report that USDA is investigating Tyson Foods. That report coming from Investigate Midwest. It says in an online article that the Packers and Stockyards Division is actively investigating the company, citing interviews with contract growers and a USDA employee. The report says a USDA employee confirmed an investigation is underway as of earlier this month. Meanwhile, it says contract growers told the news agency they were asked questions about debt that they took out to work with the company. The USDA would not confirm or deny if there was an investigation and Tyson Foods has not responded to investigate Midwest request for a comment so far. The EPA has released the final version of its herbicide strategy. It's intended to protect more than 900 federally endangered and threatened species from potential impacts of herbicide. The final strategy includes more options for mitigation measures, including cover crops, conservation tillage, windbreaks, adjuvants, and berms. Growers already using those will not need any other runoff measures. The strategy will consider where a species lives, what it needs to survive, along with where the pesticide will end up. Now, the agency says this will allow it to focus restrictions only in situations where they're needed. Now, the American Soybean Association commenting on the strategy, concerned about its complexity, potential costs, and stringent requirements that it feels may not be practical for farmers. We've reported on the recent slump in lumber prices, and now it's leading to the closure of some sawmills. Interfor Corporation announcing it would indefinitely curtail operations at its sawmills in Meldrum, Georgia and Somerville, South Carolina. The decision will impact 180 employees at both facilities. Experts say the decline in lumber prices is largely due to a decrease in demand. The U.S. housing market has seen a significant drop due to high home prices and elevated mortgage rates, which make it financially challenging for some consumers to purchase new homes or undertake renovations. Scouting fields is serious business, until it isn't. We'll have a little fun with the crew on the Pro Farmer Crop Tour this week today in the country. Olympic athletes are being celebrated for their amazing skills, but at this year's Pro Farmer Crop Tour, our scouts are showing off their own unique set of skills. Take, for instance, James here in Cass County, Indiana, checking out the corn crop there on day two of the tour, testing out his juggling skills. Better luck next time. And this is pretty cool. Keith Gelling and Sons doing some corn yield and moisture checks with some fancy moisture scanners in southeast Iowa. Technology really has come a long way. And whoever gets to partner up with Mike Birdo on the tour is always in for a fun time. Here's Mike striking a pose as he heads into a field in Jasper County, Indiana, checking out some short stature corn. While Ted Seifred out on the tour in the east with this pro tip that corn leaves are sharp and pokey. He says, always wear eye protection. Don't be like me. Ouch. Hopefully Ted's okay. And yes, eye protection is always a good idea.
And we'll have more insights on what scouts saw on the tour later tonight on the final night of Crop Tour Live. A reminder, we'll be unveiling day four results from all of Iowa and Minnesota. You can check it out just before 8 o'clock Central Time. And that's all the time we have this morning. From all of us here at Ag Dan, Clinton Griffiths, have a great day out in farm country.